Do you know what the number one search term is on Google for open relationships and polygamy? To not be jealous. Here are the top seven reasons that open relationships and polygamy is complete garbage. Number seven comes from Exodus chapter 20, verse five and six. You will not bow down to them and serve them for I am the Lord your God and a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Sexual immorality and sexual perversion is the gateway drug to deconversion. Show me someone who is not living a sexually holy life, and I'll show you someone who will not be a Christian at the end of their life. So this reminds me of the story that comes from Numbers chapter 25 with the children of Israel. They were living a great life, and God was winning all their victories and fighting all their battles for them. And so the enemy had to make a plan of like, hey, there's a hinge of protection. God is helping them. How can we infiltrate God's people to get them to fail? And this is the plan that you can convince them to have sex and marry foreign women. And then their wives would lead them to idolatry. So this is Numbers chapter 25, verse 1 and the results of that evil plan. While Israel was staying in Shiloh, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to their sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meals and bowed down before their gods. So Israel yoked themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. So right there, it shows that to begin their idolatry, it started with sexual immorality. And so you may be saying, Winston, it's not that deep. But my question is, how do you feel so confident breaking God's laws and God's commandments and call yourself a Christian? God says, if you love me and keep my commandments, do what I say. And he also says, why do you call me Lord if you don't do anything that I say? So Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So the Bible clearly says that the wages of sin is death. This is the same argument that the devil gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that you can break God's commandments and not die. But God says the total opposite, that all sin leads to death. And at minimum, sin leads to the death of faith. There is no sin that you can commit that it doesn't kill something in your life. So we have premarital sex and sex outside of marriage and you don't want the baby. You kill it. You have an abortion and you murder. Have you noticed that even love has been killed in current culture? You don't even call sex between a husband and a wife anymore making love. It's all of this very gross and violent and vulgar language to display the action that is supposed to be reserved only for a husband and a wife. Why is killing love and the purpose of creating life? First Corinthians 6 verse 9. Don't you realize those who do you wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, worship idols, commit adultery, male prostitutes, and practice homosexuality, or thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor abusive, nor people who cheat people, none of those will inherit the kingdom of God. All right, we're going to go back to the top of that list and notice the order. It says, those who indulge in sexual sin, worship of idols, commit adultery, prostitutes, and practicing homosexuality. Did you notice that idolatry, worshiping other gods, is grouped in with sexual sin? So again, Sexual sin is a transition drug of deconversion and idolatry. Reason number six that reason number six that open relationships and polygamy is garbage. Genesis one and twenty six. 
And God said, let's make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the hair and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So right there, God says his order and how we as humans have authority in this life. If you ever notice that all these podcasts and all these teaching on polygamy and open relationships always want to continue to compare humans to animals. But the Bible is very clear that we have dominion over animals and we do not behave ourselves as animals. So right there, the Bible says that we are made a little lower than the angels, but a tactic of the devil is actually displacing you. And so now you're no longer operating your authority as a human, having dominion and rule over everything, including the earth, but you actually subject yourself to a lower stature and become animals. And I always think it's funny that they only list the polygamous animals in the animal kingdom and they never list the monogamous animals in the animal kingdom like barred owls or the bald eagles or even wolves. Why is it such a, an awful and stupid idea to compare yourself to animals? It's just, are we going to do everything that animals do? Do we eat our own dough? No, that's ridiculous. Oh wait, so activities that animals do, humans shouldn't do that because it's ridiculous? That's pretty interesting. Do animals fly airplanes? Wow, that's a ridiculous statement. Oh wait, why? because we have higher intelligence and we don't behave ourselves like something that is lesser than us, like polygamy and open relationships. So I think it's very interesting. They like to say that we are not naturally monogamous by only pointing to certain animal species, but also acknowledging that we are not animals in every way. So we don't clean ourselves with our own tongue. <laughs> we don't live outside. How about you want to be an animal and all of the areas of life, you will not because you just want to justify your own less than sin by saying that we're not naturally monogamous, but monogamy, everywhere that monogamy has been in a nation, that nation prospered, but everywhere polygamy became the ruling class in the nation like Rome, it actually went the way of destruction because just like Sodom and Gomorrah, God hates sexual immorality. Girlfriends and boyfriends did it together, living sinful lives, not getting married, homosexuality. Any such evil is in the list of people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And remember, the wages of sin is death. All it leads to is what the devil produces. The devil has come to kill, steal, and destroy. So that's all that following that lifestyle will lead to. Number five of why open relationships and polygamy is horrible comes from your natural instinct. So the number one search term for people in open relationships and polygamy is how not to be jealous. And so again, we have Genesis 1 verse 26. It says, God says, I am a jealous God. And he says, let us make man in our image. Your natural tendency is to monogamy. Why? Because to be jealous over someone is the same thing with God being jealous over us. He is protective over us. And so anything that is dangerous, that's why God calls himself jealous. He just wants you to be a partaker in that. He wants to do things that will bring you light and like more abundantly. John chapter 10 in the Bible. So if the Bible says in Genesis that we're going to make man after our likeness and after our image, we have the same characteristics, same nature as God. And so God says, I am a jealous God. I'm not going to share you with other religions. I'm not going to share you with idolatry. I'm not going to share you with sin. And so you're trying to go against your natural instinct to be monogamous uh, because again, you have to subject yourself to a lower type of being and acting like an animal to even to convince yourself that this is natural when it's not. And so if I have a child, I'm not going to allow you to teach them about dangerous things that can hurt them because I love them. And so having boundaries and saying things are right and are wrong is actually loving 
And that's why it's important to be jealous and say when things are evil and when they're not. So to enter an open relationship or a polygamous relationship, you have to suppress your natural instinct and also your conscience. And so by doing so, you also numb your conscience to what is right and wrong. And so usually it's a lack mentality of like, hey, everyone cheats, everyone's doing this. Even though if you have the option, let's just put the option out there. You can have a monogamous husband or wife who will not cheat on you, who will love you and be faithful. Or you can have an husband or wife that you would need to share in an open relationship or a polygamous, I mean, yeah, polygamous relationship. Which one are you going to choose? So it seems as if your decisions are being made by circumstances versus actually what you want, right? That fake love that looks like lust. And this person is convinced to you, if you love me, this is how I am. You need to share me. Or how about you have a little more self-worth and self-esteem and say, hey, if they love me, they will be monogamous with me and not cheat. And that's why you see people who are engaging in sex work, like OnlyFans, prostitution, pornography, or stripping, they always need to be taking drugs and alcohol. Why? You need to numb out your natural instinct and conscience to be able to even partake in this type of activity. Because the body, soul, and spirit is already telling you this stuff is wrong. And so you need to hush that down as much as possible just so you can partake in it. You have to know yourself out like when you're going through a surgery because the pain of it is so awful to have one night stands, random hookups, and just casual sex with multiple partners in your lifetime or out lights. That's just weird. Number four reason that polygamous relationships and open relationships is awful comes from James chapter three, verse 17. It says, but there is a wisdom from above that is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easing to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace into them that make peace. So it says in the Bible, when you can know something is from God and when you can know something's come from the devil, it says that when something comes from God, it spurs pure, it brings peace, it is gentle, it is easy to be entreated, which means it's easy to put into practice into everyday life and that everyone can be participants in it. And it doesn't have hypocrisy or only a few people partaking in it. This is why open relationships are so garbage and full of hypocrisy because if you notice, the people always teaching that we are naturally polygamous are always saying how evil it is for women to engage in multiple sexual partners, but always saying it is natural for a man to be polygamous and it's unnatural for a man to be monogamous. So right there is hypocrisy where, hey, if we're all naturally not monogamous or all naturally polygamous, then both sexes should engage in it. So right there, you can see that it's actually just indulging men to take advantage of rule over women. But it's interesting to me as a man is that both men and women suffer from sexual diseases. So it seems as if sin and disease doesn't care about what you naturally think in theory that we are naturally polygamous when we're actually naturally monogamous. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Flee fornication. Every other sin which a person does is outside the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. So science says that one fourth people who are sexually active outside of marriage are carrying a STD, a sexually transmitted disease. And so even science, the body is actually producing death because it says, oh, we should not be having sex with this many people or be having sex this often. Um, and the frequency of it and the 
variation of it just being with a bunch of random people is is producing disease. Now, also on their SC is sexually transmitted demons, and this is why when you are having sex with a person who's depressed and then you become depressed. You're having sex with a person who is angry, and now you have an anger problem because you're not supposed to be indulging in such debauchery, such degenerate activity. It's gross. It's evil. Because the original point of sex was to join a husband and a wife, making them one in soul, body, and spirit and mind. And even again, when we go back to science, it says that Male DNA is found in the female brain up to years after their past sexual partners or even the lowest 15 days after a sexual experience. How is a sexual encounter with your bottom extremities reaching the brain, right? Because you're supposed to be yoked with this person forever. And so that's the importance of having sex be reserved only for married people from to death do they part. So this comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And do you not know that whoever joins himself to a harlot, to a prostitute, is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one. And that's the whole purpose of sex and getting married is that you will become one with the person forever. And that's why when you see married couples who have been together for a long time, they start looking like one another. They are not naturally related, but somehow spiritually because of the covenant that Jesus Christ promises us when we do get married, he will make the two one. And that's why they start to look like one another. And this is the same way when Christians become born again. In Romans 8, it says that we conform to the image and likeness of Christ. So that's the gospel. Through grace, by faith, by believing in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection from the cross, that through his blood, we have forgiveness of sins, which is the atonement, which means to become one, and we actually become joined with Christ. It's a beautiful thing. And this is why the Bible says the mystery of marriage is a mystery because it reflects Jesus and his church. And this is another reason why polygamy is so garbage, because marriage is a reflection of Jesus' relationship with the church, the bride of Christ. And if you see from the Bible and the book of Revelation and also the book of Genesis, then Jesus is coming back for one bride. Adam and Eve only had one partner each. If God's original intention was polygamy, then you would know that there would have been Adam and Eve and Sarah and Jessica. It wasn't. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, he's not coming back for Buddhists. He's not coming back for Muslims. He's not coming back for Catholics. Catholics. He's not coming back for Jehovah Witness. He's not coming back for Mormons. He's not coming back for anybody who is outside of Christ. He's coming back for Christians, the bride of Christ, Christian, Jesus Christ. Jesus only has one religion. Jesus only has one church. One bride, polygamy is not real. We are monogamous because marriage reflects Jesus. Jesus doesn't have multiple wives. Romans 6, verse 1. All right. Well, what shall we say then? Will we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How will we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as us have been baptized into Christ Jesus was baptized into his death, being dead to sin. Therefore, we are buried with him through the baptism into death, that just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also will be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that our old man has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, 
that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for who has died has been freed from sin. We died from our old ways, polygamy, and we come monogamous and become born again into Christ. Number three reason polygamy is hot garbage and awful is because God says the point of having sex between a husband and a wife is that they will become one and that they will be attached to one another. So we're going to go strictly by science. It says that in the brain, there are neurotransmitters that are receiving chemicals from the body during sex. This is dopamine, oxytocin, and vasopressin, which they produce feelings of pleasure, attachment, and closeness. The body naturally releases chemicals for you to attach to this person. But the biggest brag that people have right now is that they can have sex and not attach to a person. Do you know how demonic that sounds? That you are able to suppress and numb out your natural body chemistry, but you're bragging about it like it's a good thing. The equivalent would be someone say, I can live my life and I don't need to eat and I don't need to drink. You are going against your direct body chemistry. Therefore, you are actually bragging that you can ignore the voice of God, both spiritually mentally and physically to the point that your natural compassion, your natural feelings, your natural love is hardened. You are numb. You are empty. You are basically nothing here. <laughs> and I just believe that people are lying to themselves, believing that you can live like the devil on earth if you're going to go to heaven. No. You're going to go where the devil and his angels will go to on the day of judgment. Hell. And you didn't even notice that the devil brought you lower and made you lesser because it says that the devil is under Jesus Christ's foot. And because the heel of the woman crushed the head of the serpent, that's us. We are the children of Adam and Eve. And so we're actually supposed to crush them, right? But it says there's a wisdom that does not come from above, but it comes from below. And it is devilish, sensual, and earthly, right? So everyone always likes to talk about this new age demonic self of lower frequency. That's just another word for demonic, right? Everyone will also take away the biblical undertones, but don't change the language. Like the devil changed the language in the garden and the Eden. Use the words that the Bible uses. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one. Now the spirit speaks expressly that in the last times, some will leave the faith. Again, I told you, sexual immorality is a gateway drug to deconversion. Listening to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with an hot iron. To be able to engage in these activities, your heart has to be cold. It has to be hardened. You have to feel nothing. You have to be an empty vessel of a person. And so that's why the Bible says in John 10 that Jesus came to give you life and life more abundantly. You can actually feel things like joy. So your ability to feel nothing during sex when it comes to attachment, the Bible says is actually inspired by the devil and you're listening to doctrines of demons of devilish inspired ideas that come straight from hell. And so that's how you actually become lower because you're not behaving yourself as some to God as listed out in John chapter one, but you're behaving like the devil. And this is why people like to say that we behave like animals. We're not animals. We're higher than animals. We're not demons. We're higher than demons. But if you engage in these activities, this is stuff the devil would do. Book of Satan, this is exactly what it says. The first chapter says that, hey, you want to follow the devil? Do whatever you want and do what makes you happy. Give in to pleasure. Give in to your desires. And this is why it's a very demonic idea when people say, hey, just follow your heart. Do whatever makes you feel good. What? The book of Satan, the first page says, hey, if you want to follow the devil, do whatever you want. <laughs> and so... Just know you're a Satanist. <laughs> you, you don't want to call yourself one. You're living like one. 
but you want to live by a Christian, do what the Bible says. It says, deny yourself because the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else who can know it. Your heart is so evil, you can trick yourself. That's some dangerous ground to be on. Number two, the reason that open relationships and polygamy is hot garbage and terrible is that it has awful logic and it just makes for a bunch of hypocrites. And then you see this logic working nowhere in life. So all these dumb terms like high value men, they say that you can be disciplined in every area of your life. That is money, physically, work ethic, everywhere, right? But you can be as sexually undisciplined as possible. Sleeping with random people, multiple people, engaging in debauchery, orgies, all this horrible stuff. But when you want to settle down and have a wife, wasting your 20s and your 30s, possibly be your 40s, giving it over to the devil, you can settle down and get married to a virgin or a woman with a low body count because she won't care how unsexually undisciplined you have been. And she will have great morals and will marry someone who has had low morals sexually, but everywhere else great morals. Sounds very dumb. But then you feel all of a sudden turn all that debauchery and degenerate activity off and be faithful to one woman. Where do you see this working anywhere in life? Where do you see someone being able to have no discipline when it comes to eating? You don't work out, you don't exercise, you're eating junk food, you're a lazy slob in your 20s, 30s, and possibly 40s. And then once you are horribly obese, you would turn that off and you're the most disciplined exercising person in the world. You see it nowhere because it does not work. And if you think that you can do this and be satisfied with one woman and not cheat on her, you are fooling yourself because there's two variables for this type of debauchery and if evil living that you're not accounting for is number one is frequency and number two is variety. And so, number one, you are having as much casual sex as you want to. And so, you're having a bunch of either different partners or the same partners living in sexual immorality. And so, once you get married, you have to just increase your sexual appetite to the point that one person will not be able to satisfy you because you're going to live like the devil. This person who is either a virgin or has a low body count has not been sexually undisciplined as you, meaning that they are normal. And because you are trying to make them join your abnormal lifestyle in the Christian faith, God is the one that puts people together. It says, let what God's put together, let no man tear asunder. And so usually y'all becoming one, the frequency or how often you're having sex, you should conform to one another because you're conforming into the image of Christ. But if you're having all this debaucherous, degenerate activity, right? You can have one wife and she may want a lot of sex, she may not want a lot of sex, but if you have created an appetite that one person cannot feel, versus if you just got married, you wouldn't even have that type of degenerate, damn bullish sexual appetite. Um, just like people who do drugs, you wouldn't have this tolerance for alcohol, cocaine, crack, weed, if you never indulged in it. So your base level is not even normal anymore, right? And then uh, that's all the frequency. So let's just say, hey, you get married and this man or woman is giving you the frequency that you had in your life. You will not be able to replicate variety like you did with your evil living. And so when you have people say, hey, just be as polygamous or open relationships or casual sex as possible. And then you can get married eventually. What you have is conflict because you're abnormal. That just is, that's just honest. And you're marrying a normal person. This person is a regular human. And so they don't want to do all that weird stuff that you are experimenting with when you're having sex with random people.
And so when you're in marriage, what this is going to make for it is conflict. So there's only a few ways that this conflict can go. Number one, this person that you're marrying, they're going to stand their ground. They're going to be like, nope, I'll lose this weird stuff in my marriage. I don't want to invite other people into the bedroom. I don't want to invite pornography into our bedroom. I don't want to invite toys and all this perversion that only perverts like. So right there, that's going to create distance, just like the devil wants. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And now that you have or distance, what that creates is resentment. And so now you have to be able to suppress your sexual appetite. But because you're not born again, Jesus being the solution for that type of sinful living and taking the appetite out of you by being born again, now you have to suppress yourself. And all that makes for it is a slavery that has to come out somewhere. And so it's going to come out in adultery. You're going to cheat eventually. It's going to come out in pornography. You're not going to have sex. The problem with pornography is that we have never created arousal without completion. And what is that going to create? Erectile dysfunction or some type of perversion, like watching children or something weird, right? Having certain type of fetishes because you can't suffice your appetite or it just becomes a sexless marriage versus if you just marry one person you don't have that type of appetite because you're not a weird person doing all this degenerate stuff so you have normal sex and you can actually have fun and joy and the privilege of a marriage so that is column number one column number two is that you actually rule and a your partner and convince them that your sexual perversion and your weirdness is normal and then they actually begin to indulge in it and so because the bible says that humans are not supposed to board themselves over other humans wherever christianity goes what you get is freedom wherever sin goes you get is slavery and so this person they're going to do a whole bunch of things that their conscience is saying is wrong and so when a person goes against their conscience actually splits them and so the word in hebrew is shalom it means that your soul body mind and spirit are one in your heart right but if my conscience is telling me this is wrong my husband or wife is telling me this is right and you are forcing me to do it because wives need to submit to husbands unto the lord so if the bible says it's wrong Wives don't have to submit, it's evil. But she just does what you say. What's going to happen is that more separation is going to come because she can't trust you. It's actually pretty evil to lord yourself over another human and to manipulate them. And that's what it is because that idea, your sexual appetite is demonic. Remember what the Bible says, it's not coming from heaven. And so now you're putting a human under that. And now they are under slavery and bondage, your weird stuff like adding toys, other people, pornography into the marriage bed. And so again, just like the first example, when you become perverted in this way, it has to come out some way. And so now your husband and wife has been perverted in that way. And all it's going to become is lack of trust. And what lack of trust is, is lack of communication. And what lack of communication is, is distance and resentment. And so it's eventually going to lead to divorce or them cheating on you. And then you're like, see, you can't trust these women. Um, no, you can't trust perverts like you that want to ruin people. And so that's the plan the enemy. He wants to kill, he wants to steal, and he wants to destroy. And that's why 50% of marriages are ending in divorce because only 6% of people who call themselves Christian actually believe the Bible. Do what the Bible says and his ways work. You do whatever you want, it only leads to death. Or option number three, I'm going to give y'all a good option. You can actually repent of your sin and you get married. And it says in Ezekiel that God will give you a brand new heart. And when you get a brand new heart, you'll have a new appetite. <laughs> and so God will clean you up and purge you of your sin. Just like Psalms chapter 51 says that he will wash you white as snow. And so you actually have to be purged from that type of evil so it's separated from you. That's why it's important to read the Bible in Hebrews chapter 4. It says the word of God is quick, living, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, able to separate ball from marrow, the heart of man from his intentions, and to cut the to the cutting of the sunder, basically us. We have to be separated from the old man that is sinful, the flesh. So trust in the blood of Jesus and he can clean y'all up. This is Hebrews chapter 13. I think it's verse 3. So Hebrews 13 says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the marriage bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers will God judge. God will judge people who are fornicators, people who have sex outside of marriage, or are engaging in sexual immorality, perversion, or adulterers, people who cheat. So if you have a whole if you have an open marriage, you are cheating because you have to be monogamous, be a faithful to one person because it has to reflect Jesus in his church. And so um, that chapter people are using to manipulate people is saying, hey, the marriage bed is undefiled. You can do whatever you want. That's not what it says. It says the marriage bed is holy, so treat it as holy by not bringing weird stuff into it. And back to science, this is the product of having more sexual partners than the Bible actually allows for. So science says when a woman has zero to one premarital partners and have a five year marriage, the divorce rate is 5%. When when they have two to four partners, the divorce rate goes up to 14%. When you have 10 or more partners, the divorce rate jumps to 33%. And people like to say, sex does not affect men like it does women. Oh, it's worse. When men have zero to one sexual partners, their divorce rate is 10%, which is higher than women. When they have two to four sexual partners, their divorce rate is 17%, which is higher than women. And then when they have 10 or more partners, the divorce rate is 28%. So everyone likes to say, Sex affects men differently than women. Yeah, they actually get worse out of two out of three categories when it comes for divorce. And this comes from the 2018 Institute Family Study. Right. And number one reason that polygamy and open relationships is awful. The reason it comes from First Timothy 3. This is a true saying if any man desires to be the office of a bishop. He desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, a husband of one white, a husband of one white, a husband, one white, vigilant, sober, have good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. There is not a single good example of polygamy in the Bible. Polygamy is so bad that you're not even allowed to have leadership as a Christian. You can't be in control of anything, says the Bible. And so all these non-Christian people always want to use David and Samson and Solomon and Abraham as examples. Oh, the Bible supports polygamy. It does it. The Bible is a historical book recording the actions and choices of humans and also their consequences. And this comes from Deuteronomy 17, 17. Let's see what God directly told all these kings in the Bible. Deuteronomy 17, 17. Neither will he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart be turned away, nor will he greatly multiply silver and gold for it and so. So the Bible actually commands rulers and kings to not take unto themselves multiple wives. Why? Because again, it leads to a idolatry, which leads to deconversion, also leaving the faith and worshiping other religions and other gods. Um, he says the same thing about wealth and money because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So since they love to quote David as having all of these wives and Solomon having all of these wives and concubines, let's see the result of their lives. What did this actually produce? Because a good tree can only produce good fruit and a bad tree can only produce bad fruit. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 10. 
This is God talking to David because he took another man's wife because he was the king. And let's see what the Lord told him. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to your own. This is what the Lord says out of your own household. I am going to bring calamity to you before your very eyes. I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this in broad daylight before all Israel. Come on. Come on. Come on. God was so angry with David and his polygamous lifestyle and killing Uriah and just the wickedness and evil of this. No one, when he got Uriah's wife pregnant, that child died. Just like when you're having random sex, you're, you're committing murder and abortion. So remember, the wages of sin is death. So that child died. And then if you read the rest of First and Second Samuel, and even Psalms, war did not leave David's household and his own son tried to kill him. And so that was the curse that he received. And so you want to use David as an example. It's a horrible example. Um, you want to use Solomon as an example. Again, God told these men to not multiply themselves, wives or women to themselves because they would turn their hearts to idolatry. Solomon, you need to read the book of Ecclesiastes. He says life is meaningless, right? He was the richest king. He was the wisest king and he had the most women. And his life became miserable because he did not keep God's commandments and live. So, hey, if you want to be a polygamist, you can suffer the same thing that they indulge it. All right. Last question that you need to answer. Where does polygamy come from? No one ever asks this question and where the answer is will shock you. It comes from Genesis 16. In Genesis 16, God promises Abraham, I will make you a father of many nations. And he is a hundred years old at the time, not of the promise, but when they begin to take things into their own hands. And so Abraham's wife, Sarah says, hey, we're old. It's not likely that we're going to have kids naturally. We should make a plan. You could take your maid, your bondwoman, Hagar, and you can have sex with her, and you can have a kid that way. All right? So Abraham's like, hey, I should listen to my wife. Has sex with Hagar, gets her pregnant. They have Ishmael. God chimes in after their decision making because, again, the Bible is just a book of what God says, what is God like, and who is God. So sometimes he lets us make our own decisions. And God says, no, your son will be a legitimate son, and he will come from your wife and from you. And so, boom, Sarah gets pregnant, and she has Isaac. Wow, this is not the end of the story. So now you have two women carrying your children and they begin to fight. And then Sarah, who actually made the idea, began to treat Hagar so badly. So Hagar begins to call out to God and God actually helps Hagar because Sarah says, get rid of her son, Ishmael, and get rid of Hagar. She will not share the inheritance with my son, Isaac. And so right there, you need to know that polygamy was birthed in unbelief and in sin. Because again, she thought that, hey, it was a good idea because she was old to have another woman conceive the child to be able to perform what God already said. But this is in the book of Romans. If God actually says something, 
it will come to pass because he's sovereign and he has providence. He will perform it. It's his will. And so what is the fruit of this choice? So when Hagar was crying out to God, God made a promise to Hagar and to Ishmael that they, uh, they will be blessed by him. He will multiply them. And so the lineage of Ishmael and Hagar are the current Muslims and they are the current Islamic faith, right? Islam is the top killer of Christians to this day. This is why the Bible is banned in certain countries. It's illegal to be Christian in certain countries. And Christians are the top martyrs worldwide because of original sin of unbelief. And so remember, the wages of sin is death. You cannot break God's commandments and live. It only brings forth death. And so again, people think that polygamy is so great. And it's awful because everyone knows that the best functioning household for children is one father, one mother, absent father households have higher rates of incarceration. They go to jail, drug usage, they become addicts and also crimes. So they do awful things. But when you have a husband and a wife in a household, kids thrive. Now, can't give you a whole bunch of awful things. Also, I have to tell you good things. What's the answer for polygamy and all this stuff? It comes from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Know you not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. A whole list of everyone that's going to hell. Verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So he talks about the power of the cross, the blood of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. This is the beauty of the Holy Spirit's name. His name is holy. And so part of that holiness is that Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinless life. He never sinned in action, thought, deed, or creed, where he said. And so it says the wages of sin is death, judgment, but Jesus took our judgment unto himself unto the cross and he says all those who believe on him shall have eternal life so jesus defeating death proved himself to be god himself because he died and was raised from the dead through the power of the holy spirit gave his eternal life to everyone who believes in him so we are saved by grace the power of his cross on the power of his resurrection through faith that we are and then transferred uh, by receiving it unto us. He gives us his eternal life because again, the wages of sin is death. Jesus never sinned, so he never needed to die. So by him dying, he is taking our curse, our sin, our disease, our slavery unto himself becoming a curse because Galatians says, curses every man who dies on a tree. And so he broke the power of the curse of sin that's in this world. So if you have lived a horrible life, you're in sex work, you are in over relationship or whatever, you can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus by believing in him and receiving the Holy Spirit. Once the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you, he will purge you. He will cleanse you of all your sin. You will be white as snow. So Thank you for watching the Blessed Report with Winston Mail, the regular Christian guide. Make sure to get our devotionals and our email list in our newsletter by clicking the link in our bio or description box below so that you can join us. Make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and watch the next episode that's on your screen. Thanks for watching.